Williams, and welcome to uh, this evening's class of Education 689. Um, this is our second to last class. Next Wednesday is our last class, and uh, it has gone quickly. So before we get rolling, does anybody have any burning questions they need to ask me before I introduce Dr. Weinstein? Okay. Uh, Professor Williams, when is our last reflection paper due? Uh, it is due, let's see. Just to kind of fresh everybody's memory, I know that's one of our last... It's in the syllabus and I'm just yeah, I know. leafing but... through it here. And last reflection paper, July 16th. Got it, thank you. It's in the syllabus. I, I, tr I trust the syllabus more than my memory. <laughs> Very good. Um, any other questions, folks, before we get going? Okay. All right. So I'm excited tonight because um, the thing that Dr. Weinstein is going to speak about, the business of business for ISD professionals, um, is a very popular and important topic. And I'll tell you a real quick story. Um, we recently had the ISD program go through an academic program review, and we do a self-study first, which is a fairly big undertaking. And then we invite external reviewers from outside of the university who run similar programs. And one of the things we did was we kind of had a focus group of faculty, a selection of alumni, and some current students. And one of the things, one of the themes that came up was the need for individual, maybe non-credit type workshops in very selected areas. And one was, in general, was what Dr. Weinstein is going to talk about tonight, the, the business part of our field. Because a lot of times people will find themselves in a new job and they have hopefully good, uh, a good education with us, but the first thing they might have to do is work on a proposal team, for example, and then maybe they've never done one before. So the business part is very important. So Dr. Weinstein is going to talk about that tonight. Uh, Dr. Stu Weinstein, he's the practice leader for instructional systems at Management Concepts which provides training and performance solutions for federal, state, local government, and corporations, uh, serving 26 locations, 200 cities worldwide. Uh, Stu has 42 years of experience designing and developing uh, instructional products that have been disseminated on the internet, computer, satellite, videotape, video disc, broadcast television, CD-ROM, etc. Uh, he's the author of 61 articles co-authored several books. He's also, uh, and some of you may have already had him, he's an adjunct instructor in our program here at UMBC. He also uh, has worked for uh, IBM's Learning Solutions as well as uh, Booz Allen. So Stu has a lot of great experience and we're really excited to have him here tonight. Stu, it is all yours. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. I mean, I just I love doing this. Um, one of the reasons that I, I, I actually started doing this, this presentation in the 671 class is that um, the, uh, as, as uh, Dr. Williams said, that a lot of folks are maybe transitioning into the training field. They, they're subject matter experts in a particular area, and now they are charged with responsibly doing training. Um, and they're uh, learning a lot about theory and they learn about how to build instructional products and how to conduct services, you know, instructional services analysis, the ADDI model and all of that. Um, but when they get in there, they're, they're really confronted with a lot of business questions such as how much is it going to cost, what is our staffing level, etc. And, and many programs, including the one I graduated from uh, at Florida State University, um, really weren't offering it. And so that's why I, I was thinking about this. Uh, speaking of the Addy model, I went to Florida State University. I was on the team that built the Addy model. So um, you know that's uh, a long time ago, but it, it's also thrilling to know that it just celebrated its 40th anniversary. Uh, they had a conference in at Florida State in Tallahassee uh, to talk about you know how, what what's happened in in terms of this uh, the model and how it's uh, grown. Um, and in, in talking with Larry, you were talking about the. Um, uh, Air Force model, which I remember is 50-58, and that's back in, in your days as well. The original Addy model, by the way, I don't know if you know what the original name was. Anybody know what it was? Um, you, can, you can key your microphone or whatever. Um, it, it was called the Inter-Services Procedure for Instructional System Development. 
so the original acronym was IPISD, and um, they finally decided to cut it down to ISD, and then uh, the ADI model kind of took off and, and became a systematic approach to training, not just so much the ADI model. So um, I want to kind of transition into where do people work in, in the instructional system field. Uh, most people think it's, um, well, first of all, the military is one that is, you know, the primary um, uh, customer to begin with when Florida State uh, developed the model because it was actually developed for uh, the military. The ground, the foundation for it was uh, in World War II. Uh, the um, concern at that time was to have the, uh, to have training both for operations and maintenance available at the same time that the weapon system or the military system was deployed rather than the two-step process they had before where they would build it, then they would develop, look at the training requirements, develop the materials. Not only was there a time lag in getting something deployed, but also it, it, it was a critical time uh, of making sure that it wasn't going to be out of date by the time that they actually deployed it. So the foundation was at that particular time in, in World War II was to try and systematize it. The next iteration of that was um, in the mid-60s when we were trying to race to the moon and, um, and beat the Russians to the moon. So once again, there was this urgency to do training and development in a more rapid fashion. But in addition to the military, um, the civilian government started to uh, catch on with that because of the relationship there. And then industry um, needed to actually know how the ADI model works so that they could compete on bids and proposals to serve the military or to develop products for the military and for the government. For government. Um, and I had the privilege of being one of the first instructors to teach the ADI model outside of the university setting. Um, and half of my class were um, DOD or other government uh, professionals in our field, and the other half were military were uh, contractors who wanted to uh, compete on these projects. So they had to learn it. So that was very, you know, um, very important to start doing it uh, very early on, so that they could uh, compete. Uh, what happened after that is there were formalized programs, and you can see educational institutions is another place. There's, I, I think, in excess of 60 colleges and universities that have something that's like an ISD program, like ours. Um, and according to um, UMBC records, we are actually the oldest program, uh, actually older than the, um, from a instructional design degree program, uh, we're actually older than Florida State University. Uh, commercial consulting fell out from there, and, um, and then as people started founding, finding their own businesses, um, that that became part of the commercial sector. So now you can see these are all your opportunities. Um, you can work in a college and university as I do on a part-time basis. Um, you can go into commercial consulting. I've worked for IBM, uh, Unisys, um, big, large companies, you know, all different, I mean, sorry, uh, medium-sized and large companies, and some smaller companies own your own business. Um, and, and also not-for-profit organizations, such as the American Red Cross is one that, that uses these types of models. So um, think, you know, think larger than just simply the higher education and the government, uh, because it's everywhere. Um, and it's, people are still discovering it um, all the time. Uh, but of course, there are more models than the ADI model. There, uh, the last count I heard from F Penn State University is there's over 400 ISD models. Of course, three of them look like ADI, and then the rest of them are other, other types of models. Uh, is anybody else familiar with any other models other than ADI through their your experience, readings, or work? Nope. Um, there's one uh, you might also see if you uh, are interested in, in looking at, well, I'm going to actually cover a little bit later, but there's also some models that are a lot, le a lot more abbreviated than the ADI model. Um, so uh, you might want to look at those for rapid development, for rapid uh, prototyping. So the next thing is, what can you do as an ISD professional? Um, Typically, of course, you're designing, developing, and evaluating uh, products. It's gotten so specialized now that some people are just doing one of those, whether they're just doing the design piece or they're just doing the development piece, particularly the development because whether it's technology-based or instructor-led training, um, maybe a different set of skills. Some people have been teaching in, uh, in instructor-led training um, 
mode for a long time, but haven't really picked up on, uh, you know, like Articulate and uh, other types of, um, of applications. So they may stick right in their swim lane of, of just doing instructor-led training, which is what's happening where I, where I work. Um, we're a company of about 400 people. We have 147 instructors and, uh, um, and teach worldwide, but some are not involved in technology-based learning. Others are. Um, so you, you can specialize or you can generalize. Um, some of the questions, I'm trying to weave some of the answers to the questions in here. Um, what do you do as an instructional designer and how do you get started? It all depends what your background is. Um, some are subject matter experts who now design, develop, and deliver within that area. Others are generalists who work with companies who have subject matter experts. We have both in, in the company I'm with. Um, and then some who are technology specialists and some people are, are technology learning specialists and others who are instructor-led training specialists. So uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can get into this field. Um, in addition to the entry level, which is primarily the first bullet there, you manage other ISD staff. And that means that you're you know, mentoring and coaching as well as handling the business side of it. Uh, which I'm going to cover a little, a little bit later, about writing proposals for business and bidding and uh, supporting, your, excuse me, supporting your upper management in doing that. Um, I had a couple of questions, or there was one question in here, uh, is managing subcontractors or vendors important? Absolutely. Um, I, I, I'm on a project right now and I'm managing five. I've, I have been on projects in which I've had as many as 19 subcontractors. Um, so con subcontractor management, vendor management is really important uh, because you may not have um, enough staff to do everything yourself. Um, so there's a, there's a coordination that takes place. The other thing too that you've got to keep in mind is uh, if you're the prime contractor, the one who has all of the, who's getting all the money, you know, obviously at the top, um, the quality of your subcontractors really reflects the quality of your total product. So the management is really important. Uh, you want it not to look like it came from 19 different sources, for instance. Um, you want the client to be happy and they're not really concerned about um, how you do it because they just look to you to, as this prime contractor to, to deliver. But you've got to make sure that the people who are not on your staff but are representing your company anyway, uh, do it the right way. And so that's one of the reasons that as instructional designers we can help them do that. Um, some of the subcontractors may just be subject matter experts, not instructional designers. And then the last thing really is um, consulting. Um, and that may be that you're not doing any design, development, delivery, but you're involved in strategy. Um, many companies now would like to move into the uh, more um, standardized instructional design mode rather than the ad hoc where you know the people just get up and tell stories and and um, you can't replicate that uh, because they're their own stories and it's their own delivery and in companies such as the one I'm working for um, if we're teaching ten different course a, a course with ten different instructors we'd like to make sure everybody gets the same content the stories might change because each person has their own background, but we want to make sure that the core curriculum um, is the same regardless of the instructor that you get. That we owe it to our client to do that. Uh, we also owe it to our customers because they may be sending people every year and they don't want to have ten different ways of doing the same thing. So that's one of the, um, the areas there. Let's see. Um, oops, I just got a, a message here. From it. Hang on a second. Okay. Uh, we just had, we had a little power problem here, so I, I got it fixed now. Um, uh, what's also important too and I, is it, when you're working for companies, a lot of the companies get their get recognition in the business community by the awards that they might win. And uh, whoops, have, did I just lose you guys? Hello. I can hear you, but your screen is black. Hey, 
Hey, Stu, this is Greg. Uh, we're, we're seeing a black screen right now. Stu, are you there? Okay, folks. Um, what I told Dr. Weinstein before we got started, that um, if he has an issue, the best thing is to log out and log back in. So maybe he's doing that right now. I am not sure. So let's hang tight here for a minute. Okay, folks, thanks for being patient. I haven't received a call or anything from Stu, so we'll just have to hang tight here. I'm not sure if he was having a power issue or what was going on there. Folks, can people hear me? Yeah, can you hear fine? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. So it, it appears from a quick glance that Dr. Weinstein's the one having problems. All right, so like I said, hopefully he's trying to uh, log out and then log back in successfully. I'm not sure what sort of issues he's having. Okay, I noticed Stewart's name still appears in the list, so I'm not sure what's going on. I'm seeing um, something that looks like he's offline next to his name, presenter off. Oh, okay, I didn't stretch that out to see that. Yeah, yeah, okay, I, and when, I, when I stretch it out, yes, correct. All right. Yeah, I saw that message probably like everybody else did that said he had to plug into a power source because his battery was running low or something on his computer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did other people see that as well? Yeah, I, I saw that too. Okay. Yeah. All right, folks, let's kind of hang tight here. I'm not sure. Professor Williams, do you have a landline to him to see if we could help him out in any way? Um, yeah, I do somewhere here. Hang on. I gotta find it.
Dr. Weinstein, I see you've uh, appeared. Are you there, sir? Stu, can you hear me? Stu, can you hear me? Stu, can you hear me? Okay, folks, it appears that Dr. Weinstein has logged in, from what I can tell, because I see his name appear in the list of people. Um, but he is not, I don't hear any audio from him, so I'm not sure what's going on. Stu, are well, you there? Hello, Stu. Yes, I am. Actually, um, for some reason, uh, the audio on here on my headset uh -huh. just went to static. Okay. Okay. So let's see if we can... Uh, All right. I will, I will make you the presenter once again. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, let's just see. I don't know what happened there. Uh, we, we lost we had, picture. We just saw a black screen. In, we, yeah. I know. I know. I'm trying to see okay. what I can do. So here. I've okay. made, made you the presenter. You've got presenter. a... Okay. Okay. Click on and show your screen. There you go. My screen. Yeah, we go. Okay. Yay. We're Everybody back. Else hear me? Yes, I'm on the telephone. Obviously, you know, just. Oh, I don't know if you know that, but that's what. Yeah, I mean, you, can, I the, you can. You can. I can tell the sound difference now. Tell the difference. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and this quality's fine. Yeah. Okay. Hang on one sec. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, you sound far away, but I can okay, hear you. Okay. We'll just. We'll, cont we'll, we'll continue. We'll you, continue. You sound again. fine now. Okay, great. All right. So uh, what I was getting at, what I was talking about, is that there's a lot of awards, and using the criteria from the awards, oftentimes for businesses, gives them um, a lot of, of clues on how to be best, you know, in in the best practice. Um, so there are um, uh, various ones there. I'm actually a judge on Learning Elite, which is kind of like the Emmy, one of the Emmy type. Um, awards programs. It's from the Chief Learning Officer magazine. There's also Training Magazine. There's the American Society for Training Developments, uh, Excellence in Best Practices, etc. So, from a business standpoint, if you want to impress your management with uh, your um, skills in that particular area, um, use those criteria and and measure yourself against uh, what some of the best performers are. By the way, many of these uh, awards also have um, reports and um, and books that come out um, as well on it, so that you can actually read um, why these people have have uh, attained these these high rankings. Um, so that's just kind of a clue right there to to figure out how do you want to grow your business, how do you want it to look better. All right. Um, a lot of questions that I got were from um, uh, most from most of the participants here. Uh, what are the associations that you might want to belong to? And uh, the American Society for Training Development, which is actually changing its name to the Association for Talent Development um, in, 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 during this year, is probably the premier organization in our field. Um, there's over 40,000 members worldwide, even though it says American Society. Uh, they're represented in, in, in many, many uh, countries. Um, you may also know they have a certification program called the uh, CPLP. Uh, certified Professional in Learning and Performance. Uh, I had the pleasure of actually working on one of the uh, the teams that built the CPLP um, testing, and uh, the person who's the head of that uh, was also an employee that worked for me at, at Booz Allen Hamilton. He's very, very skilled in doing certification programs, uh, Jennifer Naughton. So that would be one to join. Um, 
I want to encourage you, even though um, you know we're all basically adult learners uh, at this at this stage, um, join as a excuse me, you qualify joining as a student. So do so if you don't belong to the organization. First of all, uh, ASTD normally is one hundred and ninety nine dollars for uh, business members or for regular member. Uh, students are seventy nine dollars, and you get basically the same uh, benefits. Um, both on registration for conferences as well as um, you get discounts on books and other, those other types of things. That's the national or the international organization. There's also a local chapter, um, local to, uh, to um, UMBC, that meets right next door to where uh, we uh, have our classes, and that's on the South Campus, the um, technology campus, and that's the ASTD Maryland chapter. They meet um, 10 times a year. And once again, um, they also offer a both a student um, um, fee for for coming to the uh, co to the uh, monthly meetings, which is ten dollars. Normally, it's like uh, if you're a member, it's fifteen. If you're a non-member, it's twenty-five. So take advantage of that. Um, ASTD tends to be more geared towards practitioners. Uh, the American Society or the International Society for Performance Improvement (ISPI) um, is. Uh, also, very much in our field, I think they tend to be more on the research side to a certain extent. Um, they do embrace the same types of things that we do, um, so that if you're interested in that, you might want to check out ISPI, an excellent organization, um, and um, you can see what their publications are. They too have a student membership. I would take advantage of that. Um, if you're uh, involved in industrial and organizational psychology, of course, uh, uh, PSYOP is one to look to. Um, the United States Distance Learning Association, um, once again, is an international association, but it says United States. Uh, they, too, are uh, have a membership of, I believe, about 23,000. They, um, they do both research and practical types of um, presentations. Uh, they publish a journal, as the others do, and they have um, Inter they have conferences, annual conferences, as the others do as well. So those tend to be focused a lot on adult education um, in our field, and um, you certainly can go check those out. The Association for Educational Communications and Technology is focused primarily on K through 12 and uh, community college, but uh, they do have special interest groups within the organization that. Um, are dealing with teacher education as well as professional education. Um, I noticed in their, their conferences coming up in November, uh, which is held in Jacksonville, Florida, they're actually talking about cybersecurity and a lot of the more advanced technology uh, subjects. So that would be one to check out. Um, they are, they've been around a little bit longer than ASTD. ASTD, I believe, started um, about 45 years ago, and, and uh, uh, AECT um, is um, a little older than that. They were actually part of the National Education Association and then broke off from there. So there's a lot of history in, in these organizations, and you might want to uh, check them out for your professional growth. Uh, belonging to them also is a, a, a key thing if you're putting it on your resume or you're talking with your boss. Um, all of them offer the opportunity for a, an enterprise membership, meaning uh, depending on which organization, but it may be anywhere from five to ten members uh, in the organization will have individual memberships um, at a, a substantially reduced rate than if ten individual people join from your organization, sometimes as much as 25 percent off. So you might want to look at that um, uh, as well. Uh, the uh, wanted to focus on some of the studies that might help you understand in terms of what the state of the industry is. Um, what's popular, what's going on in terms of the, uh, uh, the trends, a lot of questions I had on trends. ASTD State of the Industry Report um, is, I, be, you know, I really think, is probably the best in, in our field. Um, if you're not a member, the cost is about $400. Um, if you are a member, it's free. So keep in mind, even if you're a full member, which would be $199, you're actually getting a, a report that's worth twice as much. And that's just one of the membership benefits. But as you can see here, the, it um, represents a lot of organizations um, in, all, in both military, government, not-for-profit, everything I talked about in the, in the front end there. 
Um, excellent research. They do a, a, a phenomenal job in terms of um, giving this, the metrics that you might need in business to your leadership so that they understand what the cost is and what the popularity is and all of the, the different things that they're doing. So um, I, I encourage you to join ASTD if you're interested in getting this report because um, you can download, in fact, you can download it five times. So um, although it's a copyright infringement to be um, uh, distributing it, um, you can certainly share it with your, you know, your copy, you can share with your uh, uh, colleagues at work. Um, in addition to that, they have a, a, a quite a few um, reports that look at specific areas that might be of interest to your leadership and to yourself as well. The Learning Executives Confidence Index um, is very important uh, because you can see what the trends are. Uh, there's a lot of questions on trends. What is um, uh, on the horizon? What is going, you know, going down? And it's done four times a year. Um, now, the, this one is also a, um, a, a fee for this particular document, but the way that ASTD structures their, fee, uh, their um, benefits is that you can select which of the um, four purchase books that you would like to have, and you're given so much, it's kind of like a bank account, you're given so much uh, uh, money or opportunities to download. And so you could select this as one of your choices if you wanted to. Um, I'm not really sure what the um, the rate is now. It used to be somewhere around 100 bucks for this particular one, um, and you're getting it four times a year. Um, so that's something to look into. You can you can get a preview of what it contains by going on the ASTD.org website. Um, many questions came up about salary and compensation. Here's another one that you can get. Um, it's done on an annual basis. Um, I think it's a little bit more reliable than going on to some of the websites uh, such as Glassdoor or um, Salary.com uh, because these, uh, the collection, the data collection for this particular document is um, done by ASTD to people who are in the field. And uh, it's rather comprehensive, but it does include all the things you'd like to know about. So if you want to see how you fit in with the industry, um, you can get this book. They also, there's also uh, the Chief Learning Officer magazine has a calculator and you can go on their website and you can say I live in, you know, uh, uh, it, it could be by state, it could be by, you know, location like Mid-Atlantic or, or Northeast and then you put all the information in there, what is your, your degree, your level of experience, the areas that your, uh, cap your capabilities are, um, you put that all in there and then it'll calculate what the mean salary, the average salary is for people in your profession uh, by title. So you can look at it, you know, an entry level, a mid-level, a manager, etc. Um, so here's another one that you can, you can get and download uh, from ASTD. Um, as I pointed out, there's uh, professional magazines. Um, I, and what I'm going to do, by the way, uh, as I went through the questions, I will send Dr. Williams a listing of, of all kinds of resources that you can get and you can click on them um, because it's just too extensive to do on this, this kind of uh, forum that we have tonight. But you can get at no cost and you don't have to be one, the Chief Learning Officer magazine. You can get it in digital form, you get it print, and you get it or, or both. Um, there is no cost. Um, the, only you don't, the only way to qualify is to uh, apply for it and um, you all would you all would qualify because basically whatever you're doing in your respective fields would be fine. Um, two things that I just pointed out here as an example of some of the things they do. Um, the, uh, you'll see on the left it says HCM Advisory Group. That's not the Chief Learning Officer magazine. It says Chief Learning Officer Executive Research Brief. That's from an organization called the Human Capital Management or Human Capital Media Advisory Group, uh, which I belong to. You can get it for free. But HCM actually publishes four magazines. Um, one of them is it deals with diversity, if that's something that uh, that you uh, want to include in your repertoire, um, and also uh, other magazines. They're all free. They're all downloadable. They're all available to you just by um, applying online for them. The other one on the left is the Chief Learning Officer magazine itself. It's also part of another group called MediaTech. 
they have multiple magazines. You might want to look at that as well. And um, as you can see, one is on executive education on the left, learning delivery on the right. Um, ex excellent um, uh, PowerPoint as well as um, uh, white papers and extensive studies, no cost for any of that. They also have webinars almost every single week. So what I also do is when you sign up for this, if you're interested in webinars, let the, you know, click on that. Most webinars are around lunchtime in this, in this time zone. Um, they may originate from California at 9 o'clock in the morning and it'll be noon here. If you have the time and want to do it, I do it at lunchtime, by the way. If you want to do it at lunchtime, that's fine. Um, but if you don't want, if you don't have the time, register anyway because you will get a link that says, sorry you couldn't make the webinar, um, and here's the link. So this way you won't miss anything. You can, in many cases, you can download it, or you can save the link. It's usually up for at least 90 days. Uh, sometimes they're archived even a couple of years past. So if you can't make it, click on it anyway, and, and your um, spare time when you're not writing these extensive papers for Dr. Williams. I'm just kidding. Um, you, could, you can actually look at, the, uh, at these webinars. And they're usually by top name people, ones who usually charge a lot of money when you go to a conference. So I, I would certainly encourage you on that. Here's another one, I, and I really encourage you to get these. Also, again, free. Uh, the company is Chapman Alliance. Brad Chapman is the owner. Um, he, these two studies, I don't think there's a week that goes by that my leadership uh, at, at the company I'm working for doesn't use it, but how, to, how long does it take to create learning? Uh, the one on the left, um, it's a PowerPoint presentation. Um, it is based on over 4,000 um, responses, makes it very, very credible, um, and it actually represents something, I'm trying to remember the number now, but it's something in the area of like uh, 10 million learners or something of that nature. But what it does is it takes the ADDIE model and it breaks it down into some very discrete metrics. Like if you're doing front-end analysis, how long does it take typically for um, your uh, data collection? And then it, um, it, what we call stratifies, it breaks it out into easy content, middle-of-the-road content, and extensive content. Um, so you can look at it and slice and dice it a lot of different ways. And the way you use this is um, when they did the study, with one on the left is done in, in 2010, don't pay so much attention to the cost because you need to plug in your own numbers for your own organization. Um, government is going to be somewhat different than commercial because commercial has a profit on it. But you can look at that. It's a PowerPoint presentation of about 30 slides, but it takes you through um, every kind of permutation that you'd ever want to do in terms of cost analysis. Very reputable. And when I get a little bit later in the presentation, you'll see that when you do a, a proposal, oftentimes they want to know how did you come to those numbers? How did they call it basis of estimate? So get that. It's uh, Chapman Alliance. When you click on there, the, you just look at their resources and you'll, you'll find it. It's not very hard. How, or, or Google, just you know, Google or, or use Bing or whatever you use. Um, how long does it take to create learning? It'll pop right up for you. The one on the right. It, uh, the one on the left basically is looking at classroom-based instruction and very basic CBT. The one on the right is looking at blended learning and, and uh, goes into more extensive um, electronic or technology-based learning, uh, such as simulation, etc. Once again, it's a benchmark study. It doesn't cost you anything. It was done in 2013, um, and it's very, um, very current. Even the one in 2010 is still very um, beneficial. Um, as far as how long does it take to do it, it's still the same. How much does it cost? You plug in your numbers and you can, you know, you can figure that out. All right. A um, couple of other questions I had is what's new in the field? Um, how many people, if I can, or if anybody wants to put it in the chat or, or key their mic or something, have heard of the six disciplines of breakthrough learning? Anybody heard of it? Raise his hand. Not me. Okay, I have. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to bring this to your attention because oftentimes what we're doing is concentrating on the design, development, and delivery, but not so much on the transfer of training. How well does it transfer to the job? It's usually the assumption is once you finish your class and you've passed your test and maybe done um, 
uh, a trial run, all of a sudden now it's going to transfer. And we all know that, that you have to do a little bit more than that in order to make sure that it sticks. Um, this model, which um, has been around for quite a while, uh, was developed by, it's developed by a company called Fort Hill Company. Um, and don't confuse that with Fort Hill Paper, which does paper products like napkins and, and that kind of thing for the food industry. But Fort Hill Company, the uh, Cal Wick and Roy Pollack and Andrew Jefferson, who you can see as the authors there, they all come from both um, an, a, a higher education background as well as industrial background. So they've worked in large companies. They've also taught this. Um, and what their uh, approach is is focused on transfer of training. So this is not a design model. This is something that you should use in concert with um, Addy model or if you're, um, if you're familiar with M. David Merrill, um, which is a constructivist um, a model. Um, and I don't know if you know the difference, but in a cognitive, you're, you're actually teaching and it's didactic teaching more so than a constructivist in which the constructivist model, you're actually building your own learning um, experience. Um, and uh, maybe it's a little bit more like, like Socratic method, which is kind of what I use on my class. But what they, if you look there, right in the center of the screen, it's defined business outcomes. Uh, and by the way, business doesn't just mean commercial. Um, if you're, uh, such as um, Dr. Williams, I mean, he's running a business because he has staffing, he has budget, he has facilities, um, he has people who report up to him. So even in, uh, in a higher education, it's no, really no difference. It's just the, the way that you do your business. Define your business, and that's, this is where the six Ds come from. Design the complete experience, which is a little bit more like our analysis side. Uh, deliver the application. Drive for learning transfer, and that's their big, big thing there. Deploy, deploy for uh, performance support and do document results. And the document results is how do you, as a, a few of the questions here, was how do you let, you, how do you value, or I'm sorry, how do you measure the value? Um, the answer to that question is the value is measured by the people who are the recipients, not you, <coughs> because it's they are the the reason that you're there, um, and it's not just simply the effort that you put out, but um, it's the results that you have on the other end. Okay, so this is something to look look for. If um, I, I use this in my 671 class, uh, for those of you, I know I'm sure you've probably taken it, but if you haven't, um, uh, this is what I use. But if not, um, you can go on and and get a copy of this. I think it's well worth it. Um, in addition to the six disciplines that I'm showing there, they just came out with a book this year called the Field Guide for the six disciplines. So that is um, a, an excellent book for saying how to implement that in your, in your um, organization. So this, this book here is somewhere in the area of like uh, $34. And I think that the field book is about the same. It's about $39. So it's not cost prohibitive. Um, in addition to that, the, the company also puts on webinars and for free. And they also do workshops and uh, consulting and everything else that goes along. So it's not they're not just publishing a book. They have a full service um, uh, capability to, to help you if you wanted to implement it. Okay. <coughs> the next thing, somebody was saying, what's new um, in, in addition to, we, we know the Addy model, which has been around for um, over 40 years. Um, how many people have uh, heard of SAM or of this book, Leaving Addy for SAM? Anybody done that? I have. Um, just curious, what have you you've heard of it? Has anybody implemented this or has considered implementing it in their in their organization? Um, I've had some discussions. Okay, does anybody want to talk about it? Uh, what the, I was just curious from the discussions and what um, you know what maybe led to that. Um, they, can they do that, Dr. Williams? I'm just trying to... Yes, they can talk. They can unmute themselves and speak. Sure. What well, talk? Un, un, yeah, because I don't even see anybody muted. It looks like everybody's open. Hello? Is this Patrick? Okay. Well, it doesn't sound like I'm getting anybody. And, yeah. It should come through the phone as well, right? It's yeah, someone's there. Well. 
Someone's there. Okay. I think Beverly. Yes. Oh, hello. <laughs> um, Hi. I just was curious what um, what you're saying because I'm considering this for where I work. That's why one of the questions. Um, I I just saw I guess the uh, Sam model uh, when I was just uh, looking at other you know or different types of models and um, it's something that uh, we have discussed in our mm -hmm. training team but it's nothing that we've actually implemented. And, and who do you work for, or where, or where do you work? Uh, University of Maryland, University College. Oh, I used to work there too. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's very good. Yeah, I did before the job I have here. Um, one of the pluses that I found for this is that a lot of people would like to uh, have a more, uh, a quicker design, you know, quicker go, you know, uh, to to market, if you will, if they're commercial, or to solve their problem. And what's different about here is in the Addy model, it's linear, and when you get to the end, then you come back and you do your revisions. Um, the, the SAM model is basically you're working a lot more with subject matter experts, and you're constantly revising as you go through. Now, that sounds like formative evaluation, and it is to a certain extent, except that you don't go, you, you start the, the approximation model, meaning that you, you start out with an idea, and then you storyboard it, as many people do, but you come in a very rudimentary fashion and then work with your subject matter expert, and then you'll create a better looking storyboard, um, and then go back to your subject matter expert, and then you will make it a dynamic storyboard, if it's one in which it's computer-based training or something, technology-based interaction. It also works for classroom-based as well. Um, but what it means is you don't actually get to the end to find out how it's working, you're actually doing that all the time constantly revising it, and their claim, and, and, I, and they have research to back it up, um, is that they're actually able to design uh, as much as you know, like 30 percent or more uh, are, are faster. So that's one of the, the reasons that, they, um, that um, Michael Allen, who also um, has been around for a long time, uh, AuthorWare was the first product that maybe people have heard of AuthorWare um, that, that he launched. Um, so he, he and the Addy model are almost the same age. The problem was is that the Addy model uh, was appropriate for the time, and this was way before its time because this is based on what's called the Agile process, and Agile is what's used a lot in software development now. But to the, the concept of doing this years ago was really not working. Um, if you know the Addy model's history, it's really not an education model, never was. It was always an engineering model. So when you talk to people who are in the engineering technology field, um, you might want to find out what is their model for designing or manufacturing or creating their products, and then, super, or then lay underneath it the Addy model, and you can show them that what we call analysis, that's what they do. What we call design, they might call prototyping, and et cetera, et cetera. So you can win their hearts by letting them know that what we have here is not a touchy-feely, that it's actually a, a, a solid model. That's the Addy model. Um, and SAM to, is the same basic kind of thing, except it's a little bit quicker. You can see on the left side there, um, th this is another, uh, I would say, uh, you know, a slide that you could put in there that um, helps your management and your customers um, the and the students to know that you're not just simply doing this as a, a procedural type of process, but that um, what they've um, patented or, or copyrighted here is that you have the um, activity, feedback, context, and challenge, and then they want the learning experience to be memorable, motivational, and meaningful. Um, if anybody's you know familiar with um, uh, some of the motivation models, I don't know if you've you had a chance to, to see any of those, but um, this actually follows along with Malcolm Knowles adult learning principles. It also follows along with um, some of the models that came out of um, Florida State University and others. One called the ARC model, and um, that's a motivation model. So what I think that, you know, what, what's here, and, and, and to answer the question about what's new, this seems what's new, and it says leaving Addy for Sam, which I think is kind of a cute title. Um, they, too, are a full-service organization that can provide um, workshops, uh, consultation, 
uh, development, whatever it is that you're interested in doing, you can go on their website. They have a lot of um, um, webinars that they've archived that will introduce you to this model. Uh, once again, this year, uh, Leaving Addy for Sam um, is now has a field guide for implementation just like the six Ds. Um, I was privileged to have um, Richard Sykes, who's the, Sykes, who's the second author on this, um, and also Angel Green from that company um, presented to my 671 class just about five weeks ago. Um, they were here to do a presentation to Johns Hopkins University for the use of this model. And um, I snagged them when they, I heard they were coming in town. They're also personal uh, colleagues of mine. And um, they, they literally came off the plane, grabbed dinner, and came over and did a presentation. So I mean, I just think the world of them for doing that. Uh, but I will, I've also opened this up, um, the speaker, you know, the, their, their session to anybody in our, in our instructional design community. I hope to get them to do it again next year, and if I do, I'll, I'll let Dr. Williams know that so that we can invite our alumni, our active, our present students, and also our colleagues from around the uh, the uh, organization here. Um, let's see. I'm seeing here from uh, Leila. Uh, the, we recently began the Agile process, and I can attest to the fact that it's significantly more rapid. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. I'm always interested in seeing what um, it, it it really what it does is it cuts to the chase. Um, let's see, Larry. Um, is Sam more rapid development? Yes, it is. Uh, of course, you got the answer. Um, I looked at it. Okay, um, one of the one of the um, the things that are that is coming out here is, is that the models, some of the other models we have, were just too extensive, and you you need to learn how to um, shortcut. And uh, just as kind of as an aside. Um, the, if you've heard of Robert Gagne, uh, Robert, Bob Gagne, or Dr. Gagne was uh, actually my major professor at Florida State University, and the, if you want to say in quotes, the father of the Addy model. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to do, or what I wanted to originally do for my doctoral dissertation, was to find out how to reduce the size of the Addy model, which was about 600 pages of documentation, to something a little bit more reasonable. Otherwise, you know, you'll never finish. And uh, he told me it would take probably about seven years to do it. And coincidentally, ASTD came out with a book by uh, um, Dr. Pischurek, who wrote the first a book called titled Rapid Instructional Design. And I called him up, and I said, how long did it take you? And he said, well, it was around seven, eight years. <laughs> so Gagne was right. And uh, this is kind of the answer to the question, how do we make it shorter and, and still keep it, um, um, have the, the integrity? So. That's um, that's what this is, and it's for your consideration. This is not to shortcut um, Dr. Hodel's book, which I think is excellent. Um, I think really what I would do, and this is what I'm telling my leadership here, is we need to learn the Addy model and do it well here, because many of the solicitations, procurements, requests for information uh, are asking us for our uh, what can we do with Addy, because they haven't adopted this model. But then if you have a choice and you want to do it faster and you want to save some money, this may be, and it, you know, it's not a commercial, but it may be the, um, the solution um, as long as it's not something that your client asks for. Always make sure your client gets what they want. Um, and, um, uh, but there are alternatives. There's also, you might want to look up M. David Merrill. He has a book called The First Principles of Instruction. That's the one I alluded to not too long ago. Um, I was also a content reviewer for, for Dr. Merrill's book, so I know that pretty well. And his theory is called Pebble in the Pond. It's a little different way of looking at instructional design. Um, it's a little bit of a pricey book. It's about $115. But um, if you have access to that, uh, you might want to take a look at that as well um, because it is a different way to approach it. Um, what it's really looking at is, um, uh, a way for people to construct their own learning for themselves and then to carry it out. So it's, it's a very simple explanation of it. Right, so um, I think we're, there we go. Okay. I just realized what this is here. Um, so uh, are there any questions up to this point? Because this is kind of like a little breaking point here in the, in the presentation. Um, anything that anybody would like to present or discuss, question? 
Um, let's see, what is this? I have a feeling some of my vendors are using this mod. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, Stuart, yes. this is yes. Patrick. Yes. Patrick Malone. Yes. Um, yes. I um, I use a lot of vendors for my for the, my e-learning products with uh, with Anne Arundel County, and when I discuss it with my reps, I I, I tend to gauge them because they're not really familiar with the design process, mm -hmm. but when when, I, when asking them kind of when I can expect you know new products to adopt to adapt to you know new education regulations um, when I was presented Sam last summer I had a and, and it was presented in the context that it was more geared towards the e, the e-learning community or technology based learning uh, because of its rapid prototyping and kind of cycling back on itself mm -hmm. uh, it, th throughout development so I think they would agree with you on that, I mean, or agree with those, those folks on that, um, because their their premise there is they're trying to develop replicable in instruction, like modules that you could develop it once, and then you can change the content and 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 use that successful approach. Um, so I, I and in fact that question came up in my class as well as the presentation. Excuse me, presentations I've seen on this, um, and that that's actually true. Uh, but um, we're hoping to, to use it here because 85% of what we do is instructor-led training. So we can run it the same way that, Sam, that the SAM model was built in, in that um, we work with our, our subject matter experts in-house. And we have probably uh, somewhere in the area of 60 subject matter experts. We primarily do financial training for the federal government, which would include auditing and proposals and project management and that type of thing. Um, but um, yeah, that's uh, and then some people say Addy has no value in technology because it was developed 40 years ago. That's nonsense because it's been updated 11 times, um, and it's actually delivery agnostic. You can use it for anything because it's a basic model, um, and then how you deliver is how you deliver. Um, so yeah, that's um, it's a good point. The other thing is I think some of the people who are dyed in the wool uh, Addy folks are going to say, ah, oh, this is no good. Because uh, I just heard of it, <laughs> so that's. Uh, well, but one, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. One one of the things, just listening to the the other presenters, is is a reoccurring question throughout the last couple of weeks has been kind of, you know, what learning theories do you adhere to? What uh, process do you use? And this is it, it, so on and so forth. Um, but I, 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 at least from my perspective, the consensus has been, you use what works best for the client or the project at the time. So to say I only use Addy or I only use SAM, I, that doesn't seem realistic, at least from the experts that we've spoken to mm -hmm. in the last eight weeks. And, the, and you're right. Um, the Addy model is not the, you know, the gospel according to Gagné. I think it, it, the thing is you, you understand what the process is. And I, know, I don't even use the word Addy. I use systematic approach to training, which is it doesn't tell you, it's not any particular model. I mean, it, there is a model called that, but what I do, I, I think they're, they're, I mean, they're absolutely right. I agree with that. You internalize that process, and you do deliver to the, con to the um, um, customer or the client uh, what it is they want, and they're absolutely right um, because you understand that there's a systematic way of doing it. You're analyzing something, whatever you want to call it. You're designing something. You're prototyping it. You're, you know, but here's where the problem is that some of your customers are going to say, I want you to do it according to this model because I expect my reports, my periodic reports, to be in that same format. <coughs> so you can't, you can't say, well, we don't really follow anything. Uh, we're just going to give you, you know, what our thoughts are. Um, so it, that's what I'm saying. You might want to at least be aware of and uh, a little bit more than conversant in the models. But then if you have a choice, you probably could cut through a lot of the, the uh, complexity by just doing it systematically. Um, and as I say, when we, we had our own, we're, we're developing our model here, and um, I told them the same thing I just said. You know, if we're doing it internally, let's do it the most efficient and effective way to serve our clients. But then we just had a, a request for proposal that came out from the Defense Acquisition University. They don't use Addy. They use an Addy type model, 
But the difference is they have 41 reports for, that, that, that you have to do according to their guide. Um, so you, you throw all of this out the window and you say, okay, I'm going to have to read your procedure and then follow your procedure because that's the only thing that's going to be acceptable to them if, uh, if we win. Um, so, uh, you know, um, I've been doing this a long time and I, I, I most of the time never talk about all the theory. That was, a, I think, one of the questions in there was, well, you know, how do you separate theory from ISD? I never talk theory. I, in fact, I don't talk about behavioral objectives or any of the things we talk about with my clients. I just talk in plain English. You know, what do you want the people to do when they're finished? How will you know they're doing it well? Who are the people we're serving? Just that kind of thing because the people who are buying these services from, that glaze over when you start talking about behavioral objectives. Um, I had one client that says, behavioral objectives, does that mean we're misbehaving? No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> That's when I stop using it because we know what it means. but. Uh, they just want to hear something uh, as in terms of the results that somebody might uh, you know, might might see. Um, it's it's kind of like when you go to the doctor; you don't want to hear all the clinical stuff. You just want to know, can you make me feel better? Um, so that's that's how I've kind of mellowed from all of these <laughs> all of these models. But I, I just caution you, you: you just need to be able to talk about this. Otherwise, you can't uh, can't really compete all the time. That uh, I don't even know who the other presenters were, but. Um, uh, they're 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 saying the right things, you know. Um, any other questions? Did I answer your question? Does that help? Or? Yes, thank you. It does. Okay. Um, anybody else? Anything that um, it's the right way is that there is no right way. You're absolutely right. <laughs> absolutely right. Um, this this may this looks kind of. I mean, it is government related, but it's not any different than commercial. Um, proposals but in the business of our business we need to let our let our hello need to let our clients know what is we're going to do for them how long it's going to take how much it's going to cost just basically that and so in the government parlance they call a request for a proposal um, in the govern they also in the commercial side but what they do is they put out a description of what they'd like to have done uh, one of my clients is is Amtrak Corporation which is not a government entity, it's actually a commercial passenger railroad corporation. Uh, they put out an RFP and said we need to have leadership training. And this is the, the number of people we want to train and these are the things we want to do. Um, and then we write a proposal to them on what we're going to do for them, how much it's going to cost, how long it's going to take, and how you know um, that people have learned. Um, and, and if you haven't already experienced this in in your professional uh, practice yet. Most people don't want you to do analysis because they already know what's wrong. They've been working there for a long time and they don't want you to do evaluation because that's padding the bill. They already know whether you've learned or not uh, or their, our employees have learned or not by just um, talking with them or asking them. You know, like level one Kirkpatrick um, and level two Kirkpatrick, um, meaning the you know, the smile sheets, did you like what you did and did you learn something as measured by a multiple choice test which may have no relevance at all to the, what you just taught them because it might be how to do something physical and then you take a multiple choice test and you know all the parts of that physical activity. Here's what I do and I, I use a lot of analogies and a lot of things that help my client know why I'm not padding their bill and why it's important for us to do analysis. Um, and I don't think there's an engagement I've ever been on when somebody didn't say, well, we don't need to do anal an analysis. How long is it going to take? And I said, well, it could be, and I'll, I'll, I'm just doing a hypothetical, but uh, we, we really have to um, interview people. We'd like to interview people. We'd also like to look at your documentation. We'd like to know what it is you're doing. Um, and then where's the gaps as you perceive them? And maybe two to three weeks, something like that. You know, I'm, it's just kind of an average. And they'll go, well, we don't, know. we don't need to do that because we've already done it. We already know that we need to have training done. And, and I, of course, you know, I don't argue with them. And they said, and besides, how can you do in two weeks? We already know what we've been doing for 10 years. Um, well, I said, when you go to it, and this is how I use the analogies. When you go to a doctor, he or she uh, is going to examine you. And so you say, I have a pain in my elbow. And th does that mean that the doctor has to have experienced the same pain? in order to know what your pain is? Or is it that that doctor knows what to look for, what questions to ask, what kinds of 
um, test to perform. Might be an x-ray, might be something else. Um, and then they can diagnose you in a very short amount of time. Well, how could they do that? Because you've got the pain and they don't. And, and it usually works for them. I mean, you know, uh, all the analogies I do is outside of the content area of the client that I'm talking with. Because if you start talking and, and, and faking it or trying to figure out what it is that they need to do and using their terminology, they get very focused on whether you're correct or not correct in the use of your terminology, your concepts. Or, so do something that's like general to anybody, like going to the doctor or fixing your car, um, and use that analogy. And then it kind of drives the point across without insulting them. But then they also start thinking, yeah, you're right. Um, experts can do things quicker, and they don't have to have had it, in order, or you know, in the case of pain, in order to do that. So keep in mind, instructional design is not just theory. It's also uh, client management, it's psychology, and many times it's hand-holding. You know, so that's on the, on the uh, analysis side. On the evaluation side, um, if you read the 6Ds book, this is one of my favorite quotes in there. When should we give a certificate completion? At the time the people register, the last day of class, or two months later? And most people, when I've, you do this as a, as a webinar, say, oh, no, we need to do it at the end of class. And they contend, do it at the beginning of class, because you don't know much more about whether they've learned it other than the test you've done. Or in other words, they're getting to the transfer training piece. You don't know any more about whether they've learned it the first day of class than the last day of class. So the answer is really months later. <coughs> but we don't do that. We give the certificate of completion on the last day of class as they leave. Uh, but they haven't really completed the learning process. So you really, they should be awarded that once they can demonstrate sometime in the future that, um, that they know what they're doing. It seems a little radical, but that's actually, I think, something that people need to, um, to tell their clients is it, learning is not complete on the last day. Um, so here's a, and it's very hard to read this, I'm just showing as a representation, but you can see what they do is they talk about the background of the request, whether it's commercial or government, the scope of the work, um, all of the things that they're, that they're requiring, you know, have done. <coughs> may have to take a break and get some water. Um, the next, let me see, we'll get this here. Um, I don't know why this pop-up keeps coming up, so I need to get rid of that. Um, and then when you submit the proposal, it's usually a formal document in which you explain all of the things you're going to do, as you can see in here. Um, maybe a little bit hard to read, but you're, you're not only talking about what you're going to do, but you're also providing information on about what you've done in the past for other people that is similar to what you're doing for them, or maybe even identical. So th this is another phase of our, or another piece of our instructional design approach. And that is we have to convey in words, sometimes in presentations, sometimes um, both, uh, what we've done to convince the, the client or the organization that we are skilled at doing this. So this is just very typical. Uh, you'll notice I have IBM um, um, examples here. That's because I recently left IBM and I don't really have anything from the, our company here that is comparable to it. Uh, but this was for a very large training contract uh, worth upwards of $47 million uh, for the uh, U.S. courts. And this, um, the uh, final product was, were five volumes, and it was approximately 450 pages. That's a lot of writing, but you don't have to do it by yourself. Um, but that's, that's one of the things. You can just see uh, past experience, uh, management plan, what kinds of things you're going to be doing. All right? And then in the past performance, they're kind of zeroing in on um, uh, whether it's commercial or government. Um, who have you done it for? When did you do it? How current was it? Uh, how much did you as a company um, or an organization, whether it's your own or whether the ones you're working for, and what was the price? Uh, oftentimes they ask that because um, if, if you're talking about doing $50 million projects and the biggest project you've ever done is $400,000, they may question whether you have the experience to handle something huge and big. Um, so that's what this is showing here is all of that information. This is all public information. There's nothing here that's proprietary because um, this was done for the government and it was 
six years ago. Uh, but you can see this is the type of thing. What they might also do is reach out to the technical point of contact. That's usually the person you deal with at the organization. Or they might deal with the contractor, uh, contracting officer. That's the person who does the business side of the, of the contract to find out how you did. And they might even send out a questionnaire um, asking those questions. How well did you do? Um, how satisfied? Were you on time? Did you, were you on budget? Were you able to predict things properly? Um, and so that's something you need to be collecting the data and preparing uh, what people call sometimes qualifications, sometimes they shorten it to quals. Um, when you do a project, capture all that data immediately so that if somebody asks it in the future, you have it ready to, to, um, to show. In addition to that, maybe the person who ran it is no longer with your organization. Uh, you may not be able to capture it years later when you need it. Okay. Um, this is an example of an incredibly complex <laughs> presentation that we did, that I did, uh, to, the, to the government. But you'll notice right up there on the top is the ADDIE model. Um, and what the customer wanted to know is, what's our process? Uh, how are we involved as a customer? What kind of tools do you use? And what do the, do the deliverables look like? So this is a graphic representation of the whole process, um, all on one picture. It's, I know it's hard to read. Um, I, I, it is readable, I can see on the screen here. But uh, they wanted to see everything, how it lines up. And what I was talking about sometime early, you know, a little bit early in the presentation, is you can also superimpose if they are uh, in the manufacturing business or they're in software development or whatever it is they're doing that's the engineering based model, you can put that right at the bottom and they can actually see how what you're doing lines up with what they're doing. Um, so that's something that um, pictorially rather than if you wrote this out in narrative it would probably be like 40 pages. Uh, this way they can see it all in one place and it's uh, obviously a lot more, um, it's much easier to look at. <laughs> but in addition to that, you can use this as the um, advanced organizer, if you're familiar with that term. Uh, show them the whole thing, the overall, um, the German word is called Gestalt. And then what you can do is go down and you might even look at every one of these boxes if they request and talk about how you can identify the end user group. I'm looking at the upper left. How you can assess the training and, uh, you know, and on and on and on. So uh, use a lot of pictures especially if you're doing a proposal that has a very limited amount of, of pages you're allowed to respond. In some cases, it could be, you know, tell us what you're going to do in 10 pages. That could be very short if it's complex. However, a picture, like they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. Sometimes the picture um, will get you through it rather than having them build a mental picture from your narrative. <coughs> Pardon me. So. And one example, just taking the needs assessment using the IBM model that I just talked about before. But when they say, what do you do in a needs assessment? Well, we want to determine the current condition. We want to figure out what are your goals and then rank order in importance. We want to define the skills, knowledge. Um, by the way, I usually say the skills, knowledge, and, uh, and attitudes. Most Many people say skills, knowledge, and abilities. Um, my bias there is abilities to me is the intersection of skills and knowledge. So it's almost saying the same thing twice. <coughs> attitudes for me is something different. And they say you can't teach attitude. Anybody think you can not teach attitude? Um, OK, well, here's an example. Here's another analogy. They say, well, you can't really teach attitudes. That's something that you kind of grow up with or, you know, you through your um, maturation period. But here, here's one that I use as an analogy. You can, um, you're all drivers. You, you've learned the rules of the road. You've taken the driver test, the written test. You've also driven with a, an examiner. And he or she has said you know how to apply those rules. OK, now you're on a, on a, a road, 1 o'clock in the morning. You come to a stop sign. There's nobody around. Should you stop? Well, some people say, who cares? There's nobody around. Of course, it could be a policeman around there, but you don't know. The attitude is, regardless of the condition, I'm still going to stop. There's no, I don't see any cars. I don't see any headlights. I don't see anything going on. But my attitude is, I always need to obey the stop sign, regardless of what's there. It's not just there to keep me from hitting people. It's something I need to do. OK, well, that's an attitude thing. So 
that's integrity? Absolutely. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, there are other people uh, that would run through it and say, eh, well, you know what? Their attitude changes if there is a police officer uh, sitting behind a tree and says, oh, by the way, you just went through the, through the stop sign. You didn't stop. And you can't say, well, it doesn't matter. It's 1 o'clock in the morning and I didn't see anybody because the obviously the rule is you stop. So um, that's what I tell them. And so when, they, when we get into attitude, um, especially if we're teaching safety, if we're teaching uh, one of the uh, graduates of our program teaches nuclear power plant safety, you better believe that attitude is a big part of that. It's not just simply knowing about nuclear energy and how to operate the equipment. It's knowing what to do so that everybody's safe and, and not, uh, um, you know, not in any kind of harm's way because you have a, you know, a, a, a flippant attitude. And then, of course, you can see what the rest of it is there. But that, this helps the client to see what it is. And as you can notice, um, it's primarily in just plain English. You know, they, this is just normal kinds of things that people in, in organizations would, would say. Um, the next thing you want to do is talk about how we're going to manage the work. And so um, you do it diagrammatically. Who is going to report to whom? And you might see that in this case we're talking about the, at the bottom part, the proposed um, uh, organization after we've been working for a while. And that's in the kind of the shaded area. And then up top is when we get started. So we might show that in the early part of a project, we're going to have very few people to get it going. And then once it's underway, we have to add more people. That shows how you're spending your money, shows you how you're staffing it. <clears throat> um, you might also have in there, what does the customer have to do? They have to provide people who are knowledgeable. Um, that could be one thing. If you're in a facility, you might have to have somebody escort you to the location because it's like a huge big plant or some, you know, a big manufacturing plant. Um, if it's security, you might have to have somebody unlock the doors for you because you don't have access without them. Uh, that kind of thing. So you want to do it pictorially so that they know how you're going to do the job. Um, any project, every, every project has risk. So you want to let the client, the customer, your boss, whomever know what is the risk um, and how are we going to mitigate it or how, what are we going to do about it. And I think the biggest risk in our entire profession is getting subject matter experts to work with us because they usually have full-time jobs doing their full-time work. And all of a sudden now, even though the client or the company that you work for says, oh, sure, we'll have them available, the biggest roadblock, in fact, the biggest delay is when they're not available and you have to deliver something. And they go, wait a minute, you know, we... They're, they're making money for us. We can't pull them off of that to answer your questions. Um, so you put that up front, <clears throat> and you start talking about um, what the risk is if they don't do it and how the schedule might be delayed if they don't do it. And um, you know, you're, you're kind of putting the onus on the people who are constraining you. Um, unfortunately, this happens a lot more, and I'm not being um, disrespectful. It happens a lot more in government than it does in commercial, because <clears throat> commercial starts realizing the dollars lost in not getting to whatever it is they need trained, where the government might, they're not looking at it from a profit and loss standpoint. They may look at it from a mission not accomplished, but they, they may have more of a, the mission is more important than you, because you're, you're getting paid to be a vendor, and our mission is what we do for a living. But then, of course, when it's late, they immediately blame you for the delay. So um, just keeping that in mind. I know there's people online here who work for the government. Uh, I've been doing this a long time, too. And that usually is what happens. So what you do is you really form a good relationship where they understand, <clears throat> excuse me, they understand that when they say um, to the vendor, and this, this is to respond to whomever it was that was talking about vendor management, um, when they, I've had clients say to me uh, on, on the government side, it's okay, just relax for a week because we have this thing we have to do. Well, my boss doesn't relax when I'm not charging money because now he's paying me out of profit, or, or technically not out of profit, but he's paying me out of the, of, of the company's um, reserves for doing this. And th we're not happy when we're sitting. We're not relaxing. We're actually on the edge of our seat. 
commercial people will know that immediately. They'll say, oh, yeah, if we tell you to stop for a while, you're going to lose money just like we would lose money if you asked us to do the same thing. So keep in mind that part of this management process is, is um, client relationship. You really want them to like you and to respect you, and you don't come in you know, demanding because you work for them. They don't work for you, regardless of where it is. But on the other hand, you, you need to be upfront and say, if you delay, here's the results, and, and then let them tell you what their decision is. But meanwhile, um, you're collecting the information about the delay, and in some cases you may have to charge them for the time they delayed you because it cost you money to pay your, your staff. Um, and then finally, who's going to manage the project? I just happened to pull one up from myself. Um, but who's going to be in charge of it? And um, I, if you've seen my resume, um, this would be uh, evidence that um, the kind of project you want me to do is the kind of project I've done before and give you confidence that, that the, um, the people um, that you've selected are going to do the work. Um, in this particular case, uh, it was kind of an interesting comment. Not only did they want to know your educational background, if you can notice it there, but under each one, they wanted to know the estimated classroom hours that you you know to complete your degree. I've never seen that before, but what was interesting is they they really wanted to know um, how much you know whether it's seat time or computer-based training time. They call it classroom hours, but they also count you know not physical classroom. They count the uh, you know things like in, instructional time anywhere. And they measure that in terms of the level of knowledge that you probably have. We all know that doesn't make any sense. That's, that's called butts in the seat, but uh, metric. Um, and a lot of people do that. Let me see. I have mics. I mean, I'm sorry. One of the things that I'm, I'm never as good at is reading the chat while I'm talking. Let me just see. What do we have here? Um, OK, Walter cannot agree more. Thank you, Walter. <laughs> I uh, like that. That's good. And uh, Larry, my experience was great as far as ac access to SMEs while in the Air Force. We had no delays in our folks. Um, we're handpicked the very best. Let me talk to you about that, Larry, because when I worked on that project, <laughs> um, you know, you're right. They were there. And you know why? Because the Air Force was mission-oriented, and the people to whom we who reported to us were actually assigned to us. And that was really a pleasure, the fact that they, did, they didn't have collateral duties, that they, uh, by the way, I work, uh, Larry and I just discussed before we, we got online here, we both worked on the same project, uh, which was um, for an Air Force, um, video disk-based Air Force uh, radar um, um, operation and maintenance of an Air Force radar system at Keesler Air Force Base. So I probably know you, Larry, I just need to kind of get refreshed on the, but uh, anyway, the, yeah, the Air Force did that. That's because the people there could direct those people to do that. So that's a very good, very, very good point. Oftentimes, we don't have that luxury. We have to catch them whenever they feel like uh, supplying the subject matter experts. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'm going to just go through some. Uh, this is another break. Does anybody have any questions? This is kind of a break in the thought process. Um, does anybody want to? to uh, take a bio break or go go away for a few minutes or so? Um, I don't know what your protocol is normally. Yes, OK. Um, I, I think I'll do the same, too, because I want to get some water. I'm, I'm running out of, uh, of steam here. Uh, what happened earlier was um, our, it looked like our server went down. I'm working at, I'm at work. The wireless system, I, I think, went down for just a brief period due to weather. And when it came back up, um, for some reason, it didn't come up. So what I'm doing right now is I'm using a, a Wi-Fi that I have from Verizon in order to connect to the world. Um, and I don't think my Wi-Fi connection likes our audio or something, so that's why I'm on the phone. So why don't we take, how long do you break? Um, Whatever you'd five like. Five minutes? That okay, would be let's fine. do five minutes. Five minutes will be fine. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Be with you shortly. Check out our website at www.managementconcepts.com to learn more about our high-impact training and customized learning and development. We help you to achieve your goals while giving you the knowledge and practical skills you need to succeed. 
please continue to hold. A representative will be with you momentarily. Visit our website to learn more about management concepts, assessments, and consulting services, and browse our library of practical publications and resources to find tools you need to enhance your job performance. A representative will be with you shortly. At Management Concepts, we understand that each organization has unique goals and challenges. That's why we develop truly customized learning programs for each client combining the right mix of workshops, coaching, e-learning tools, job aids, and certificate programs. We invite you to visit our website at www.managementconcepts.com. We apologize for this delay. A representative will be with you momentarily. Thank you for holding, and we apologize for this delay. A Management Concepts representative will be with you shortly. Check out our website at www.managementconcepts.com to learn more about our high-impact training and customized learning and development. We help you to achieve your goals while giving you the knowledge and practical skills you need to succeed. Please continue to hold. A representative will be with you momentarily. Visit our website to learn more about management concepts, assessments, and consulting services, and browse our library of practical publications and resources to find tools you need to enhance your job performance. A representative will be with you shortly. At Management Concepts, we understand that each organization has unique goals and challenges. That's why we develop truly customized learning programs for each client combining the right mix of workshops, coaching, e-learning tools, job aids, and certificate programs. We invite you to visit our website at www.managementconcepts.com. We apologize for this delay. A representative will be with you momentarily. Thank you for holding, and we apologize for this delay. A Management Concepts representative will be with you shortly. Check out our website at www.managementconcepts.com to learn more about our high-impact training and customized learning and development. We help you to achieve your goals while giving you the knowledge and practical skills you need to succeed. Please continue to hold. A representative will be with you momentarily. Okay. Oh, there we go. So, what happened? Uh, We back on? Let's see. We're here. You're here. Yeah. What I'm what I'm trying to find out is now that my um, uh, instructor panel or the the panel on the right has disappeared. And I don't know why. So just so I can. Um, hmm. Let me go back to this. Oh, here we are. Okay. Um, I guess it t it times out after a period of time or something. Okay, so um, is everybody back? 
course, that's kind of a silly thing. Hey, raise your hands. Haha. -ha. Agreed. <laughs> um, oh, the music. <laughs> Yeah, I put it on hold because um, I'm, I actually had to move to a different office in order to do this to get my connection. Um, and the, the cleaning crew is cleaning. And they're nice enough not to be doing vacuuming right now. Um, OK, so what I, what I wanted to do is to go through um, the, uh, just a brief prog a couple of programs that I've worked on to show you the full range of what goes on in, in terms of doing um, um, a project from a management standpoint. This was done uh, for the Defense Intelligence Agency. This is an unclassified briefing, so it's not in violation of anything. Uh, and it was done, uh, once again, when I was at IBM. Uh, probably one of the most extensive uh, products that I've ever created. Um, it's a 10-week briefing uh, in response to the concerns that leadership had in the uh, Department of, of uh, Homeland Security, um, as well as the Office of the uh, Director of National Intelligence. Uh, during 9-11, during, uh, there wasn't a lot of communication, effective communication between agencies. And that's because people weren't used to sharing. Um, and so this is um, a leadership program for them to understand what, e uh, what each other's agency does, as well as to form that kind of relationship in which there's uh, open communication and, um, and, and capabilities to, to, you know, to uh, help each other. So the first thing we did, what they wanted to do is use various learning styles. They were trying to experiment with this. This is a pilot program. Um, initially, they had um, they were looking at IBM leadership competencies and, and the Department of Defense and uh, intelligence community competencies to be teaching um, the uh, participants in, the, in this professional development seminar. Um, the problem there was um, IBM was, was talking about P&L all the time, profit and loss, and they weren't, really weren't talking about basic leadership skills. They were talking more about leadership skills in a manufacturing firm. So what we did is we supplemented that with a program, uh, if you're interested in something that I think is a, an excellent program, uh, called Harvard uh, it's from Harvard Management, um, which is Harvard University. It's called Manage Mentor, and what it, what it consists of are um, mini modules, if you will, that take about an hour or so to take um, on, on single concepts within the um, leadership community. So it might be on communication, it might be on how to um, work with difficult employees, etc. Those single concepts. And you can learn the basic concepts, and then on top of that, they have articles from Harvard Business Review and other journals. If you want to get more research-based or you want to get more specifics, they have um, uh, streaming video where you can see interviews. You can hear from some of the top thinkers in that particular um, topic. And the whole thing can be um, printed out, not, not the video, but everything that's static can be printed out in a, excuse me, in a booklet format so that if you're traveling, you can read it on a plane or um, or, or on your way. Um, so that was this really fit everything that the DIA wanted to have. Flexibility, different ways of learning, different ways of seeing things, and the ability to drill down if you want to know more about a particular um, area. <clears throat> so the vision was to facilitate common and consistent management models across the intelligence community, um, to develop the managers, the new managers, beginning managers, uh, which they defined as, P, as um, um, professionals who had less than three years of experience managing people, and also um, for advanced managers who had greater than three years and typically um, less than 10. And then the final was to transform how they learn from classroom events, as we all know about, where it's just you know lecture, 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 to the just-in-time approach, which is that printing out or being able to go online whenever you're available. Um, and uh, you didn't have to be at a particular place at a particular time for all the time for this class. In some cases, you did have to be in a workshop where you all had to be there. <clears throat> Excuse me, be there. However, um, you also had the flexibility to do other things um, at, at another time. So here's what we did. <clears throat> 
the concept was 25 frontline supervisors, those are the beginning supervisors, and 25 experienced managers. And the goal was for the people who were experienced managers to help the new managers learn about managing. So it's not just me as an instructor. We had multiple instructors, um, almost I think almost 20. Um, but they all had their own special areas. But they also, the whole idea here, which was kind of um, hidden from the students, is we wanted people to talk with each other, not just simply sit and face forward. So that's why we had these two groups um, work together. <clears throat> and what it involved in, you can see on the left there, self-study. Um, the HMM is the Harvard Management or e-learning modules. We assigned uh, somewhere in the area 15 to 20 for this 10-week course. However, here's another thing. It is something we did that really, really pleased the, 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 man, the leadership that we were serving and piloting. Um, the minimal amount of time you could get a license for the Harvard Management or programs, of which there were 47 learning modules, was one year. But this whole process that we went through was less than three months. So what we did is we said to, to the government, you've already paid for it, so we're just going to leave it open for a whole year. So if any of your students want to go back and either revisit what they've learned or look at some of the modules they've never seen, they can do that too because it's all included. Um, we found that there was a lot of voluntary going back and there was also a lot of voluntary looking ahead or finding modules in something we didn't teach that, that really worked with them. The next one is the, it, where it's the Joint Intelligence Stu, I can't hear you. I don't know if it's just me. Stu, this is Greg. Um, I don't think we can hear you. Okay, folks, this is Greg. Um, I think we've lost Dr. Weinstein again. I'm not sure um, if he's having some of the same problems he had just uh, mentioned to us uh, uh, a little while ago. So I guess all we can do for now is just kind of uh, hang tight and hope that he uh, is able to log back in and uh, reconnect with us. So let's be patient and hang tight for now. Thanks, everybody.
Hello, Stu. Are you back? Hello, Stu. Are you back? Okay, folks, I see uh, Stu says he's um, trying his cell phone now. The IT group has gone home, so now he's on to plan C, he's saying. So once again, I guess we have to just um, hang tight and be patient. Thank you, everyone. Hello? Can you, can you hear me now? Hi, Stu. This is Craig. I can hear you. Hi. Yeah, the phone system just came back up. Don't we love technology? Absolutely. I can't believe this. Uh, I don't know what happened. Anyway, we're back on. Um, so we're. <laughs> thank you for your patience. I guess this is real world. Um, uh, the next thing we did was group learning. I'm just kind of picking up what we had on there. Uh, the um, by the way, if you didn't hear my last comment, the movies were. How does the public perceive the uh, intelligence community? And they and, and I'll show you some of the movies that they showed um, to see if it's really depicting a proper. You know as they thought properly. The group learning, we had facilitated webinar, webinars, we had learning, what they call learning labs, which um, are basically workshops, uh, with case studies, role plays. Um, one thing to say about the role play is that we had people playing roles they don't normally do in their real um, jobs. And talk about discomfort, it was incredible. Um, they're used to being, you know, whatever it was they do in their role play, they used to being replicating what they do in their job, but that we put them in situations in which they had to be the opposite. Um, in one case, for instance, uh, uh, it was um, where a military uh, personnel had, took over a facility and um, they had to deal with the mayor of the town and they had to deal with the police chief and um, the police chief was actually treating them like they, you know, <laughs> like they act. And so the, the whole idea there was that they were in the role of not being who they are. Um, they might have played the role of being a reporter um, and then getting, uh, you know, stalled by the um, uh, leadership that's there saying, well, we can't tell you anything that's confidential, etc. And meanwhile, the, of course, the reporter has to report the news so they keep pressing and pressing. And, and there were a couple of people actually walked out on the seminar, on the web, and, I'm, I'm sorry, on the um, role play because they, they didn't like the pressure. Uh, it embarrassed them. Well, hey, that's the way it goes because that's the way uh, maybe your colleagues acted. The, and, and the final thing was on-the-job training. I'm, I'm sorry, on-the-job application. Now, here's what we did that was a little bit different than most people do in a course. And a lot of this was my own, uh, you know, experimentation. Um, usually in a project, you present to your classmates and the classmates ask questions. And um, I said, you know, we need to kick this up a notch. Why don't we... And these are all people who are at a, uh, if you're familiar with, a, you know, GS 13, 14, and 15, uh, which would be equivalent to, you know, uh, mid-level and, and upper-level managers in a, in a company. Um, why don't we have these people from the intelligence community present to people, it, you know, at high levels, such as the director of the DIA uh, or the National, Geo, you know, National, uh, I'm sorry, the um, uh, Geospatial Intelligence, NGA. Um, and etc. Well, this was almost unheard of, but I, I, I said, why don't we do this? Because the projects might be useful, not just as an academic exercise, but they might be useful to the federal government. These people are very smart. They know the field, and maybe their, lead, their senior leadership needs to hear it too. And we pulled it off. We actually had people from all of the agencies who could really make a decision if they heard what they liked. Um, and so that not only kicked it up a notch, but it also gave them a real purpose for doing the project, not just simply to uh, satisfy the requirements of the, of the course. Um, so here's the learning labs. Uh, they were two, uh, there was a two-day orientation lab and a five -day, uh, two five-day uh, workshops. And in those workshops, I'll show you a little bit about what we were doing in there. Um, we had them discuss what they learned in the, in the CBT modules and uh, what they uh, read in the books, because there were several books they had to read. Uh, by the way, this didn't go on every single day for 10 weeks. 
they might be there for a couple of days and then they, they'll be reading books and they'll be watching things and they'll come back together a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> the Learning Labs, as you can see here, has a, a lot of different things. We have book discussion by DIA, uh, DIA instructor. We have a General Accountability Office presenter on flash mentoring. That's real quick mentoring, and not it's like flash dating, except that it's or speed dating. I mean, um, so. But here's another government person who's uh, talking about it from an administrative level. Um, Russ Balding talking about the speed of trust, uh, which is a, a he, he, this gentleman is a, uh, a Stephen Covey authorized um, a facilitator. <coughs> the people that are, as I'm going to the right there. McLean, uh, Delaney, and Thomas, the three gentlemen there on the right. Um, John McLean was a former Army. Tom Delaney is from the Department of um, Labor. And uh, Solly Thomas was from Office of Personnel Management. <clears throat> they, all re they all retired from uh, government service. Um, but they, you can see the different perspectives they had, federal agency, regulatory agency, and a military agency, and on and on. And you can see I'm down there in the lower left. Um, as well as another colleague of mine from IBM. Uh, we were facilitators as well as presenters. Um, the simulation was done by the gentleman there, Lead Sim, uh, by John Dentico, also a presenter in my uh, 671 class, and Tom Strong, who uh, over to his left, <coughs> who was uh, in charge of the CIA Leadership Academy. Um, we originally were going to have like four or five webinars. Um, it, it blossomed in a, in a way we never thought was going to happen. Not only did we have the scheduled webinars in which people got together, as we're doing tonight, hang on a sec, but they said, hey, can we use these webinars to help plan our uh, action projects, the ones I was just talking about that are presented to the uh, senior leadership of agencies. Um, so they, they decided they would use the webinars, and they did. Um, Webinars for project team meetings, you can see there's 12 of those. Uh, the four learning sessions, <coughs> and then we use 10 of them to review um, some of our in-class pro uh, projects. And you can see that's on the left side. On the right side, you can actually see when those occurred and, and what, it, what actually occurred. So you see um, the, the M5 and the S5. The S, um, I'm just coming down like the fourth line there, S-3 team meeting. Um, S is supervisors, okay, that's the senior level experience guys, and the M is managers, those are the beginning folks. So you can see it's a smattering of, of everybody. <clears throat> and of course we, we measured every single thing um, to, uh, without being obnoxious, but every single thing, such as our Harvard Manage Mentor. These are the projects, I'm uh, sorry, these are the CBTs that were assigned to the students. Um, in um, the management cadre, cohort. Um, and you can see delegating was the most popular, and customer focus was probably the least, and I'm not saying it's popular, but effective. Um, <coughs> so we got feedback from them on how, on the value of what they, what they, they saw there. Okay, so this gave us an, a, a lot of data to understand what we need to do when we revise it, uh, what to include, what not to include, uh, based on their usefulness, the most useful and the least useful. We did that, and by the way, this briefing is about 40, 40 slides. I'm not going through 40 slides, but you can see this is a smattering of what we did. Now, if, if you recall, what I originally talked about was Harvard Managed Mentor is the one that's in a turquoise. The Joint Intelligence Virtual University is the yellow books, various books, some of which you saw there, uh, Speed of Trust and others, films, and the project. And now you can see in just one little screen capture, or one little uh, uh, um, uh, diagram, um, where they felt the most value was for them, relevance, of course, is to their job. And of course, Harvard Management are one. The next um, that was a little stronger was the, were the books and the films. And this is prior to them actually doing the delivery of the project. This is when they did the project. but had not gotten feedback from their senior management. Um, it also showed them that <coughs> the government CBTs, the, the uh, JIVU, um, was about half as effective in their minds as uh, some of the others, of those folks who were doing strongly agree. 
but you can see that um, it was still the agree was probably um, the best measure there. Um, and you found very few people disagreed with anything that we did. So we felt really good on a first shot, first time out doing that. Um, so that that was kind of an idea how to do a pilot. Um, one of the things, and this is, I would say, uh, a metric you never think about, but um, but it it really means a lot to me, and I think it would to you as as a uh, a leader in this field. Um, we had the deputy director of uh, the um, DIA asked her. Uh, by the way, she's now the well, now the head of the uh, um, NGA, Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Um, we asked her to come down if she would hear one presentation, and we were very very strict in terms of the timing. If if these senior execs were there at one o'clock to hear it, we were ready at one o'clock. There was no delay. We totally respected their times. Well, she came down and, and is in the building. She came down to hear this one presentation by one of our action teams, and was so in, in and was so enthralled with what she heard, she actually called back to her administrative assistant and canceled the rest of her appointments for that uh, afternoon, because she said this is really worth hearing. And I'm telling you something. If there's anything that warms your heart as an instructional developer, it's for somebody at that level to say, um, I think this is important enough for me to not leave. Um, so we were very pleased with that. Uh, what came out of this, and I'm not showing it because you know there's a lot of slides, but two things came out of this that also were a big reward to us. One was the um, uh, Defense Intelligence Agency puts out a, um, a, a journal every two months. And we were actually a feature article in there, written by them, not by us on the program and how effective it was having the Harvard, the IBM, and the government um, personnel all work together. Um, and that was in 2008. In 2010, the Department of Homeland Security, another group, actually replicated what we did in this, in this course with different books and different projects and different films and everything else. And they, DIA put out an article that said uh, the, the 2008 um, uh, project gave birth to another set of projects. Now we at IBM were not involved in that, um, which was actually a plus, even though we didn't make any money on it, because we did a good enough job for them to actually do it for themselves later on. That meant that the replicability that DIA wanted was right there, because they didn't even have to come to us to say, what do we need to do? Uh, we work with them every single day for, prep for, for prepping for this. So they were as knowledgeable about what we were doing as we were, and vice versa. So that's, that's something to keep in mind. If you can share the successes and get it into the press, in this case, it's um, within the intelligence community. It was not classified. But um, that, that helps you to get more business, by the way. So here's another one, uh, another project that I worked on, uh, also which was just through IBM. Um, and here's what the, the situation in the Virgin Islands, they have a 911 emergency system uh, in place, in, and this was in 2010. Uh, but all it really was was a telephone um, that um, was hanging on the wall in the police department. And when you would call up and say, uh, somebody's, uh, there's an emergency, somebody's choking, there's been a traffic accident, whatever it is, all they would do is really um, call the other agencies um, not on, the, you know, not on the radio, but on another telephone, and tell the fire department to go here, and the police department to go there, and the ambulances in the U.S. Virgin Islands are not dispatched out of the, out of the fire department. They're dispatched out of the hospital. So now you've got three agencies. Well, that's very inefficient. But the major problem was that nobody that was answering the phone was qualified to give advice on the phone like we do here, uh, such as, I'll stay on the phone, and I'll help you through this emergency. Um, it could be anything uh, from you know a, a really dire emergency, such as somebody with, with gunshot wounds. It could be delivering a baby. Uh, they weren't qualified to do anything, and the agent, the um, uh, Virgin Islands would not allow them to do it from a liability standpoint because they weren't trained. So here's, here's the instructional design, the business piece. At first, we thought we were going to teach them how to use the hardware and the software that they had and uh, be able to enable these, these various um, um, devices. 
but we had to even do more than that. We had to teach them to be basic EMTs. So when they answer the phone, they can help the, the caller with their problem until the uh, first responders get there. Um, so the project team, this is just, just to show you the wiring diagram. We had to coordinate the police department, property and procurement, which are the people who are actually running the, um, the um, um, equipment that, that supports the 911 folks. Uh, the BIT is the IT folks. So now they, you know, there's a lot of um, installation of equipment. The Department of Health, so they people could be certified to give advice. The fire department, or they call it the fire services, the EMS. And then the last one over there, you see this is in the center row, Vitima. That's equivalent to, to FEMA. It's the Virgin Island Territorial Emergency Management Agency. So now we have to do is we have to get all these people who are our clients on board with what we're doing. And we got to do it at the price we said we were going to do. So that kind of shows you how many lines of communication that we had to do. Now, if you go to the top row, you'll see on the, on the front, uh, Jean uh, uh, Griot, a director of communications works directly for the governor. And this project was actually one of the governor's three promises to the Virgin Islands on how he was going to make it better. And so we better darn well do a good job because our boss is the deputy chief of staff for the governor. So you got all this tension um, as well as trying to do a good job. And we had to report out um, on a biweekly basis for almost 11 months on how we're doing because it was the governor and the deputy and the uh, lieutenant governor who were our audience. Um, they were nice people, but you know, still they are the governor and the lieutenant governor. Um, and so our project team was built around those same areas that you just saw there. Um, we had, of course, the, the requisite um, you know, VPs and everything from the company uh, that I was working for. But uh, their, their counterparts are right next to them. So we have an executive sponsor, and then we have the, uh, uh, the US Virgin Island executive sponsor, the governor's uh, deputy chief of staff. We had a project manager um, on our side. And then you go to the right, the BIT deputy director. That was his counterpart, et cetera. And then the typical things. We had project management uh, going on the bottom row there. Organizational change was a big piece. And here's the reason, because most people didn't trust 911. They figured, why the heck should I call a, a telephone number so they can call another telephone number? Well, the problem was is that they'd have to call the fire department, the police department, and they have to make the judgment as to what they should do. Um, so how do you get adults who are so used to not calling 911 to start calling 911? Um, they are adults. Um, they uh, are not those who are going to, they're not going to be um, maybe as cooperative as you'd like them to be, and they also are biased as uh, against the system that doesn't work. Um, so they do the best they can to help themselves by not cooperating. Okay, so here's what we did. We decided that the, the bio, there are no bias, typically no biases in kids. So we actually developed a coloring book about 911, and we, we gave presentations to the elementary and the middle school and the high school kids on what is 911 based on what we know here to be stateside. And then we had the first lady of the Virgin Islands, the governor's wife, at an agricultural fair pass out these coloring books. And so we actually worked through the kids to get their parents to do this. And the, the deal was they had to write down their phone number, they had to write down their name and their location. And here's the, another problem. There are no addresses in most of the Virgin Islands. It's all descriptive. So what happens is you go to the third intersection, you go up to where the yellow house is, and then you turn right, and then you turn left to the green house because there's no street names. So if you paint your house, you have to tell the police department because that's the only way they can find you is by that descriptive narrative rather than 123 Main Street. They don't have that. They do in the tourist area, but not in the in the, in, in, in the community at large. So um, we came up from an organizational change management place. We did two things. One is we got them to use 911 by having their kids teach their parents how to do it uh, because they would, just like we do in the States, they put all these things on the refrigerator with magnets, you know, and it had all the information about what you do with 911. The second thing is the one thing that doesn't move in the Virgin Islands are 
telephone poles. I'm, I'm not telephone poles, electric poles, because most of them use um, um, uh, cell phones. Rather than stringing lines all up and down the, the road, it's the electric, um, the electricity, uh, or you know, the power company. So we said is, why don't you put identification on your telephone poles, and then tie that to the location, so you're actually telling the police, go to poll number blah, 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 which is all in sequential uh, array, because when they do have addresses, they're not sequential. You might be 123 Main Street, and then the next one might be 1076 Main Street, because the way they assign addresses is when you bought your property. So it's not, it's not addressing like we do. It's actually tied to when you got a deed. Well, as you can see, it's very confusing. So once again, organizational change management, we help them to standardize locations so that the police, the fire, the ambulance, et cetera, could find them. That was their org, the org change person. IT person did the IT things, which are pretty typical. And I had to train people how to be basic EMTs. I'm not one, but I had to um, contract with the organization that does that. Um, and here's the plus and minuses of that. They all became basic EMTs. That means that they know the concepts. They're not actually rendering service like, you know, stopping bleeding and all that. But they did ride-alongs with the police, the fire, and the ambulance so that they could visualize what it looks like. And when they're on the phone, somebody says such and such is happening. And they have experience seeing it. And then their visual memory helped them to render service. Now think about that's really interesting, and this is for a, a, a group of people who haven't been in, in school for maybe 25 years. Because some of these people have been 911 operators for 25 years and never had a lick of training other than answering the phone. So I'm I'm faced with a an adult population that hasn't been in school that's scared to death that they're going to fail, and then they have to succeed. And the the end of the line was not only did they become basic EMTs. But their certificate was good in where they worked, in the Virgin Islands, any territory, any state in the United States. You know, continental, United States, Hawaii, um, Alaska, and then any of our possessions or territories. It was so good that many of the people actually moved from the Virgin Islands back to the United States because they could make twice as much money because their certificate of, um, of being a 911 operator was worth $47,000 starting salary here. It was 29000 in the Virgin Islands. So for those who had the money um, and could do it, they actually increased their salary by, by moving to the United States. That wasn't really very popular, <laughs> but we did what we were supposed to do. So um, we had seven different vendors, and this is to, to for the folks that were talking about vendors, um, where we had to manage IT vendors, we had to manage the, um, the folks who were doing the 911 operator training, which is communications training. We had to also uh, manage the folks who were doing the EMT training. So you can see here just kind of a, an idea here. They, they learn about their call takers or the people that are the operators. So um, you have emergency response system. That's all the technical stuff there. The dispatch system, the new processes, the, the personal effectiveness, all of that. The dispatchers, the people on the radios who are calling all of these first responders, they had to learn their thing. Then they had to learn first responder training, <clears throat> which was more technical. Um, they, the people who manage these folks had to learn how to be managers because up to that point they were just like friends. Um, they also had a technical problem. You'll probably get a kick out of this, but they were encouraged to surf the Internet as much as they wanted to between calls because if it would actually time out if they didn't do something for 15 minutes it would they'd actually automatically log off of the internet nobody I don't know why they didn't set it so it didn't happen but that's what happened so when we put in the new system the internet became now their communication link where you know people could send things over the internet to talk about um, uh, emergencies and of course, the cell phones as well was another way. So just to give you an idea of these are the kinds of things we did. Um, that these are the to topics that kind of tie back to what you just saw there. Awareness materials, we designed them along with the people from the Virgin Islands. We facilitated them as a team. 
and we train the trainers in the islands how to do that when we leave. So you can see the you know how this all kind of works out. Now look at the next one, overview of new processes and systems. We had them develop the, pro the products because if they developed them, they'd know how to edit them. So you can see how that flipped, USVI and then IBM. Then you move over to facilitate. We, now we're a team again. Train the trainer, we're now a team again. So as you can see, as you read across, if you read across there, we at early on came up with a business plan to transition out on the first day we showed up because we knew we were only going to be there for, we thought we were going to be there for six months. We ended up being there for 11 months. That wasn't their fault. It was the fact that we couldn't get the equipment uh, shipped there and, and installed quick enough. Uh, they also had to uh, secure two facilities, mean, secure meaning buying them. Um, they didn't have the money to buy them initially, so we had to continue developing our, our training while they bought out two huge, um, one on St. Thomas and one on St. Croix. They had to uh, actually buy two warehouses in order to, to put in their new 911 system, one of which was a plumbing supply company. Um, so they actually bought the plumbing supply company and all their plumbing stuff, and then they gave the citizens of the Virgin Islands free plumbing equipment. You know, it could be uh, bathtubs, toilets, etc. Seems kind of silly, but uh, it was a, I mean, to us it might be, but that's the only way you could clear out the warehouse because the people couldn't sell their plumbing supplies fast enough. So they said, okay, we'll just buy it and then we'll give it to people and that'll help them to upgrade what's in their house. Um, so we did a public service <laughs> by doing this. So as you can see, this is the different things that we did and how we were involved with them. Um, uh, the going, uh, drilling down a little bit more, what did they need to learn to be 911 operators? They had to learn how to type or keyboarding. Uh, they needed to learn how to exhibit clear and effective communication. Um, they used to answer the phone and start being conversational like, oh, hi, you know, um, Sally, how you doing? Well, the person at the other end of the phone is uh, having a heart attack. Well, it's not a time to start talking, you know, like that. They had to learn listening skills. They had to be able to write down what they're hearing. Uh, they had to have short-term auditory memory, which they didn't have, because all they were doing is just giving a phone number or a location to somebody. Now they have to actually write down what the problem was, and et cetera, et cetera. So that's what they did. Um, and things that are second nature to us, like multitasking and split listening. Uh, of course, anybody under the age of 12 is good at split listening. They can watch TV, do their homework, and play an internet game at the same time. But they needed to do that. They needed to learn how to type things in at the same time they're listening. Uh, we had to build those skills. So that's what we did. The classroom-based training, um, you'll see there it says EMT protocol, police protocol, and fire protocol. Um, those are actually little flip cards that when somebody says, I'm choking, they go, OK, choking. Um, and then the person would say, and I can't breathe. Well, think about it. They can't breathe how they talk into you. So what that ends up being, these little flip cards, is they're all color-coded. So you start, as the person tells you what's wrong with them, you keep flipping until you get the, um, the uh, solution that needs to happen. Um, and like give, as an example, there was a, an elderly gentleman who didn't know, uh, he, he was choking on a uh, chicken bone. And he's all by himself, and he had no neighbors around. He was banging on the wall. And, they, and what they did on the phone is they taught him how to do self-Heimlich maneuver, to you know, press your, your chest up against a, um, a chair and thrust yourself against the chair back, and that will dislodge the uh, foreign object in your, in your throat. Well, that all came from these little cards because they, they, they quickly understood that he's by himself and he can't do this and he needs to do it all by himself, and they gave him the all the instructions on how to do it, and, he, and, and the guy survived. So, you know, it saved a life just reading those little cards. So that basically kind of gives you an idea of it's much more than theory and it's much more than process. Um, it's actually um, using a lot of imagination and doing things you never learned in college uh, or in this program, but uh, just using, you know, your, your uh, if you will, common sense and, and, and your own adult experience to do that. So that's what I wanted to cover. Um, and I know, let's see where we are in the time. How can I help? Um, I, I, I know I tried to cover a lot of the um, examples uh, or a lot of the questions you had here. 
Um, what what is our time frame, um, Dr. Williams? Um, uh, how many minutes left? We okay, stop at we stop at nine o'clock. It's uh, I have eight forty four. Okay. Would you like me to just go through the questions? What would what would you all like me to do? Um, Oh yeah, thank you. I see amazing story, great song to the kids. Yes, and um, that's the only, and it worked very well. Um, we actually got a commendation from the governor. Um, uh, the other thing too that's kind of interesting, just to kind of give you a little bit of background, the and why it worked well too. The governor's wife uh, was an elementary school teacher at one time before she became. Um, the wife, of, well, she was the wife of the governor, but when he got elected, then of course she's in a different, different kind of uh, career path. So um, she knew how to deal with kids because she dealt with kids, and that's one of the reasons we did that. Um, would you like me to just go through? I've, I've highlighted some of the ones um, that I thought I could answer on the phone. I promise you, I will give you emails on what makes a solid a pra a performance practitioner. Um, what are the organizations, groups, and forums? You saw some of those on the screen. Now these are from Walter. Um, uh, what is the what is your take on the future of HPI consulting practice? Uh, increase, decline, or stay the same? Increase. And I'll tell you what the trend is now. <clears throat> Training is not a standalone profession. It's it's now tied in with what they call performance management, talent management. Uh, whatever they call it, they, they tend to link that with, um, with HR. So that's a very important you know, area there. Um, there was one, a couple of questions on small business. Uh, how do you get into small business and what's the greatest challenge? One of them is money. Uh, but the other thing is make sure you have a business plan, not just a vision. Um, write it up whether you're going to do this or not. Write it up as if you're going to go to a banker and you're going to convince the banker to lend you money, um, and um, so that's the first thing. Is if if in your mind you know how you're going to make your dollars, then you're going to be a lot better off than gee I hope I get customers, because if you really did go for a bank loan, which I had my own company with another well, it was a partnership, <clears throat> and the first thing the banker wanted to know is how you can make your money, and we were prepared. We told him exactly, rather than well we'd like to get some money from you and then we'll figure it out. It wouldn't get a loan because they want to know that you know what you're talking about. <clears throat> there are pro there are professional associations such as ASTD that can help you with that. <clears throat> There's also an organization called the National Association for the Self-Employed, NASE. Um, the benefit there is you can get some free consultation on how to start your business. The other thing too is that if you are a sole proprietor and have no other types of benefits, they have um, very reasonable group rates on health insurance, life insurance, and services such as FedEx, etc. <clears throat> so look to them and also look to the Small Business Administration. Uh, they have very, they're either free or very, very inexpensive courses by the, um, uh, by retired executives. Um, it's called, um, <coughs> it's called SCORE. It's the Society uh, I'm sorry, the Service Corps of Retired Executives. So people who have done this before will be more than happy to help you learn how to do it as well. So that's, I think, an important uh, thing that you need to do. Um, if I may, let's see. Um, a lot of questions were, what do you do if you don't have a lot of experience? Uh, and people are always asking for three to five years experience, even though you've just become a, um, a graduate of our program. Um, I, if you haven't done so already, and I don't know where you are in the in the program, but I assume you're much further along than than a beginner, um, is I always say you do real projects, not hypothetical ones, and most people seem to be doing that because you can use that as a reference. You know, I developed a training program for a not-for-profit organization to help them with their volunteers. Uh, one of the students in my uh, first class I taught, the 671, uh, developed an adult literacy program for the Howard County Library System. They had adult literacy, but they didn't really have a training program for that was replicable, and so that's what she did. <clears throat> so the, the, my thinking is be creative and talk about the things you've done in class as, as if they were <coughs> projects you got paid for. 
because whether you get paid or not, it's still the same experience, um, hopefully. So that's what I would say. It is very difficult to break in. Um, one of the other, many of the questions were about resumes. Um, I've kind of got a bias against that now because most resumes are read electronically. You don't even know if a human's seen it, literally. Um, it may be scanned and it doesn't pass whatever the algorithm is and, and a, a live uh, recruiter may never see your resume. You need to join professional associations. You need to network, network, network. Um, you need to do presentations if you can. If um, you can co-present with somebody, that's even better. I offer my students, I'll be happy to co-present with them at a conference. If my reputation is going to help them get on the stage, I'll be happy to do that. But the way to get a job now is to know somebody and use your internship as that venue. Go to ASTD, ISPI, and any of the other meetings that are local and, and, and um, you know, socialize with people and let them know who you are. Uh, volunteer to be on their leadership committees. Might be membership, might be program. Um, just get to meet a whole lot of people. That's the only. That's the best way to get a job nowadays. I don't. I don't think that the, the uh, pretty resume, which is you know, formatted. Every, anybody even looks at it. It's, it's all the formatting. It, it, formatting is stripped out and sent to a computer that doesn't even know who the heck you are. Um, as far as resources, um, I listed some of them there. Uh, get to know those associations. Get to know their research, especially if it's free and quote it a lot. Um, get get used to giving advice that's data-based rather than opinion. And if you can say, as, as I say almost every day that I work here, uh, 4,000 people in a study in you know 2013 said that instructor-led training constitutes 59 percent of all the training delivery in the United States. And that's a, that's a real no number. I gave it today. So when people say, what do you think about ILT? Is it dying or not? And you go, well, yeah, I think it isn't. But you know, I don't really know why I'm saying that. Get the research and try and stay up on it. And I, by the way, I, it's because I teach. Um, I, I, I spend about an hour to two hours every single day reading in my field so that I'm kind of you know, up on it. Um, so that, I think, is important. Um, do those free webinars. Um, after a while, you'll get to know who the thought leaders are and reach out to them. They're usually very nice people who will be happy to help you in making linkage. And in, in that sense, too, get on LinkedIn because <clears throat> LinkedIn is now being used extensively by recruiters to find people. Um, so that's, that's kind of what that um, ends up being when I'm watching the time here. Um, a couple of questions were uh, what additional certifications? Do you need um, CPLP is, grain, is gaining in um, uh, in prominence? Um, I don't think it's a substitute for a master's program. I think it, it's a lot of verbal learning and knowledge. Plus, you also uh, provide a project. So, um, if you go for an interview and a lot of I see a lot of job announcements say CPLP preferred. Um, they, they recognize the fact that a master's degree is uh, somewhat superior to that. But, um, but if you want to continue your education, which goes beyond what that you're learning in the class, especially if you're doing a certificate and not going for a master's degree, <clears throat> I, I, I do the, I consider the CPLP because it is a credential that people know. Uh, for those of you who know the project management side, there's the PMP. Um, the PMP and the CPLP are kind of synonymous. I'm uh, not synonymous, but they're equivalent. Um, Project Management Institute does what we do in their field is what we do in our field, and that's the uh, that credential. If you if you're also interested in bridging into a um, uh, uh, human resources type of job, maybe you're a training person, but you're also working on workforce planning then you might want to join again as a student to begin so you can kind of get a flavor for it and not spend a lot of money or maybe your client, your your company or your organization will pay for it as well. That will even be better as a student and join um, or follow the Society for Human Resource Management, SHRM. They too also have certification programs um, which they call the Professional Human Resource, that's PHR, 
or the you know the senior professional in human resource SPHR those credentials are also very well recognized and needed if that's what you wanted to um, so I you know I kind of leave you with um, networking and knowing people and joining and making yourself just as visible as you possibly can um, and it's really easy to do in the if you're located in the greater DC area very easy to do because there are two ASTD chapters one in DC uh, which primarily meets in Northern Virginia and then the Maryland chapter which always meets or has always been meeting um, either virtually or at the um, um, complex that's right next to uh, the um, uh, professional studies building in which uh, Dr. Williams and his staff are, are, uh, are housed. Um, and um, everybody typically in the, in the beginning of every one of those meetings in every one of those associations says, is anybody looking for a job or is anybody looking to hire somebody? Uh, I don't know of any of the associations that don't do that. There's a way to find and, and you know, link up with people. Um, and then if you can volunteer to help an organization so you can get that experience that you can reference on your resume. So, and that's basically, well, you see I'm coming right up on it. Um, in a prior life I used to be a television director by the way so when the show ends, the show ends because they have to go to commercial. So that's my commercial. Um, if there's anything I can do for you, let me know. You've got, uh, I will send this um, PowerPoint presentation to Dr. Williams for dissemination. Um, there's a phone number on there and there's also a, um, let's see, where are we now? Whoa, I hate this thing when it's doing that. Um, you'll see up there um, my, my work address uh, my, and my work phone. Okay. So I thank you. Is there anything else I can do for you? I know we've got like one minute left. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for putting up with the technology problems. Thank uh, you, Stu. It was great. Yeah. Well, thank you. And um, let's, let's keep in touch um, because that's another thing I will also, if we have openings here, I certainly will let people know. And uh, there is some talk about us extending, uh, expanding our instructional system design staff. So when that comes about, I'll let you know. Okay. All right. Have a well, good evening. Well, on behalf of the entire class, thank you for um, taking the time to uh, share with the class and also to prepare to do the presentation. It's not just the time you spent tonight, but to prepare it. So we, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Okay. All right, everyone. Have a good uh, evening. <laughs> okay. Good night, Stu. Good night. Bye-bye. All right, everyone. Have a good night. Bye-bye.